Hi, and welcome again to my series of videos for Physical Chemistry 2. Today, we'll continue our discussion of the statistics behind large systems containing huge numbers of molecules. When we ended video 38, we were looking at the process we used to calculate the average velocity, which is useful when we determine the velocity distribution of a collection of molecules. It turns out that if we have a function of x and we want to know the average value, we can get it using this formula. We get the average of f by just integrating f times the probability distribution. So if we want to know the average of the squared velocity, it'll be the integral of v squared times the probability distribution of v. Let's solve it. First, we need to know what the limits of the integral are. In spherical coordinates, the velocity can range from 0 up to infinity, so those will be our limits. Next, let's look at this probability. The probability here is the probability that our molecule has the velocity v. We already got an expression for that probability, which is this. If we plug that into our equation for the average v squared, here's what we get. Let's simplify this a bit by combining the two v-squared terms. And next, let's take all the constants out of the integral. So this equation tells us the average of the squared velocity is equal to this constant times the integral. Now we need to solve the integral. This is another definite integral whose solution is known. And if we look in a table of integrals, here's what we'll find. This is pretty complex looking, but if we compare this integral to the one in our equation, you can see that little n must be equal to 2, and the x corresponds to v in our equation. That means the solution to the integral must be 4 factorial over 2 factorial times 2 to the fifth power times the square root of pi over a to the fifth power. We can simplify that quite a bit. First, this fraction is just equal to 3 eighths. Now, the expression we have left simplifies to the average square velocity on the left side and 3 over 2a on the right. So we now have a very simple expression for the average square velocity. But wait, in the previous video, we already determined an expression for the average square velocity. Here it is. If we set these two expressions equal to each other, here's what we'll get. But notice what this equation is telling us. The temperature and molecular mass of the gas are both easy to determine, so the only variable we don't know is a. That means if we solve this equation for a, we'll finally know what a is equal to. If we do that, here's what we get. A is just equal to the molecular mass over 2 times RT. So we finally have an expression for A, and just as we expected, it depends on both temperature and the molecular mass. If we plug this into our equation for the velocity distribution, here's what we get. This is a very important result, and it's what we've been leading up to. We now have an equation that tells us the probability that a gas molecule will have any given velocity. All we need to know is the temperature and the molecular mass. Everything else in this equation is a constant. This velocity distribution is called the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, and it gets used in many places in physics and chemistry. It's one of the most significant results in the field of study called statistical thermodynamics. Let's see what we get when we plot this equation. Here's the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution for the first six inert gases from the last column of the periodic table. At first, these look just like normal distributions that we saw earlier. But these have some significant differences that make them much more realistic than a simple normal distribution. First of all, the means are different for each of the curves. As you can see, the velocity for helium has a much higher mean value than for heavier gases. That makes sense, because we expect that light atoms will move faster than heavy ones. 
This is much different than the normal distributions we saw earlier, where the mean was exactly zero meters per second. Another significant difference between these curves and ordinary normal distributions is that, although the curve approaches zero infinitely slowly on the right side, the curve actually does reach zero on the left side, where the velocity is zero. This satisfies our expectation that molecules in a gas are continually in motion, and they don't ever have a velocity of exactly zero. Let's look at that equation a little more closely. Notice that the variable in the equation is v, the velocity. However, as we'll see soon, the kinetic energy of a molecule is an even more important property than its velocity when we want to determine whether or not the molecule will react when it collides with another reactant molecule. For that reason, it would be useful to rewrite this equation so that the variable is the kinetic energy instead of the velocity. Let's do that. In order to do it, we just need to remember the basic equation for kinetic energy, which you probably learned way back in your first physics course. Here it is. The kinetic energy is one half the mass of the particle times the velocity squared. Now, as you can imagine, it's hard to measure the kinetic energy of one individual particle, so let's look at the kinetic energy per mole. In order to do that, we need to look at the mass of a mole of molecules instead of the mass of one molecule, so we'll use the molar mass, which has the symbol of script m. So, this equation is looking at the kinetic energy of a mole of molecules, all of which have the same velocity v. Of course, as we know, the molecules don't all have the same velocity. They have a distribution of velocities, which is given by the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. So, what we want to know is the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution in terms of kinetic energy, and that's something we can now determine. All we need to do is solve the equation for kinetic energy for velocity, and plug that into the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. To solve the kinetic energy for velocity, we'll start by multiplying both sides by 2 and dividing by m. Next, we'll take the square root, which gives us this. Now we can plug that expression into the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. The velocity pops up in two different places in the distribution equation, here and here. We plug in our expression for v, which gives us this. We can simplify this equation quite a bit. First, let's look at the exponent here. We can cancel the two masses and the factor 2, which leaves us with negative e over rt in the exponent. We can also simplify the middle of the equation. To do that, it'll be easier if we break up this term. We can split it into two similar terms, one with an exponent of 1 half and one with an exponent of 1. An exponent of 1 half is the same as a square root, so we can rewrite that term this way. Meanwhile, notice that the 2 and the m in the other term will cancel with the 2 and m in this term. That leaves us with this equation. This is the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution again, but this time it describes the distribution of kinetic energies of the molecules instead of the velocities. So, this equation is even more useful than the one that we had earlier. And it's also important for another reason. That reason has to do with the exponential term here. That exponential term appears in many, many equations chemists use all the time. In fact, you've probably used some of those equations without knowing where they came from. For example, it pops up in the rate equation developed by Svante Arrhenius. We used it in Physical Chemistry 1, and you probably also used it in your general chemistry course. And what does this equation tell us? A chemical reaction only occurs when two reactant molecules collide with enough kinetic energy to overcome the activation energy barrier. And as we now know, the probability that the kinetic energy is sufficient to overcome the barrier is determined by the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. As you can see, the frequency factor A in the Arrhenius equation is connected to this portion of the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. One thing that's important to realize about the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution is that it describes the kinetic energy for a system containing a huge number of molecules, and therefore there are a vast number of possible kinetic energies the molecules could have. 
the complete set of energy states that a system could have is enormous. We call that set of states an ensemble. When we go into a lab and measure a property, such as the temperature, for example, what we're actually doing is measuring the average of the property for the whole ensemble. Each individual molecule will have a different value for that property, and those values usually follow the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. Suppose, instead of the whole range of states the system can have, we only look at one particular state. We refer to that as a microstate, and use the symbol capital omega for the total number of microstates in the ensemble. You might recall from Physical Chemistry 1 that the second law of thermodynamics states that a spontaneous process always results in an increase in the value of omega, the number of possible microstates. Well, that's enough new material for now. In the next video, we'll look more deeply into the implications that the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution has for the entropy of a system. I hope you'll join me for that. But until next time, have a good week.